Hi, I'm Mara Webster with InCreative Company, and thank you so much for tuning into one of our talks. I'm so thrilled today to be talking about the fantastic docu-series Equal on HBO Max. We have Stephen Kayak with us today, who is the director, and Scott Turner Schofield, who is one of the actors and performers in the series in episode four. And Scott, I wanted to start by asking you about your performance in this, because I think it's so fascinating what it asks of you as an actor. And so I was very interested in how this was a completely different process of forming who a character is and forming a performance for you. You know, it was wonderful, actually, because, you know, first of all, there was this piece of it where I, you know, I got to research this actual person who really, you know, who really did live and there wasn't that much video that was the that was the one thing so I was sort of like trying to figure out like what what was his voice like how what were his mannerisms so there wasn't that much video but I got to listen to him and I got to listen to him I listened to Craig Rodwell for hours you know which was like so edifying for me also just as a queer person to like listen to this person who's had a direct and real lasting impact on my life and our collective lives, right? Like um, it, it was a, it was just like a really wonderful experience. And then, you know, as an actor to sort of have something to actually base some, you know, base your performance on actually felt like a real support. And Stephen, I know that when you came on board the project as a director that, and a showrunner, that there were certain aspects that had already been developed and mapped out. But with the performance aspect and the way that you have actors giving these straight to camera, really intimate, connected deliveries, was that something that was already percolating as an idea for the series? Or was that something that you brought on board? And then from there, how did you work with Scott and the rest of the cast on really configuring what you wanted that to look like so that all the performances had this linearity throughout the series? Yeah. Um, uh, well, yeah. F first, thanks for uh, having us on. It's a real pleasure to talk about the series. Um, yeah, it was it was kind of pre-developed. Uh, there were um, there were four episodes. Some of the characters were kind of mapped out. Uh, I think their ambitions kind of outscaled the budget and the time we had to do it. Um, I think there were some aspects where they, they thought it was going to be kind of like a, a real like big budget Hollywood thriller, you know, the dangerous secret lives of gays and lesbians uh, throughout history, which is great. Uh, but we needed to figure out how to tell those stories within the given parameters we had. And um, I've always appreciated the cinema of Derek Jarman. He's a great British queer director, real icon uh you know and has done like i see he's really queered does queered historical fictions you know like he did a film about wittgenstein he did uh a film about you know uh edward the second um the gay king and um just does them in these really reduced restricted manners you know tilda swinton is, a, is in a lot of his films and they'll just be like one actor with a fabulous hat in a little proscenium arch, you know, very minimal, a little campy, uh, but very cool. And I thought, ah, this is the way and we can do it like this because we have to just go, you know, we don't have a lot of time. We'll weave, inter you know, we'll weave um, archive throughout, but I wanted to do these cheeky little cool recreations. They weren't recreations. They were tributes, they were monologues uh, using a lot of the actual words of the subjects being portrayed. Uh, so yeah, we, we dug in and, and redeveloped some of the creative, dug a little deeper, found some different characters uh, that we felt had kind of been left out of the historical spectrum and just went about uh, finding great talent to embody these people. And when I look at the series, any single one of these subjects could have been a whole series in of itself. You know, we could have yeah, four hours yeah. just on Craig Rodwell. And so I was interested for both of you um, how you really thought about the wider context of each of these individual stories and how to really distill it down to the details that worked within the narrative that you're presenting in an episode and what were the most vital things to convey to the audience for you, Scott, with your performance and for you, Stephen, and really shaping all of these on screen. Right. Well, you know, for the uh, for the episode Scott is in Stonewall, I mean, the story is Stonewall and how it then led to the very first Pride. And so we wanted to find a range of voices who all were pivotal within that experience, um, you know, and Craig Rodwell is really key to everything. Uh, 
a lot of his words that are used in the series are, you know, from interviews or uh, written documents. So it is documentary evidence of Craig's involvement in this movement. Uh, and then, you know, we wanted it to be about experience, you know, and give enough backstory that you understand what brought all these people to this moment, you know, and, and actually, Scott, you have a great Craig Rodwell backstory of your own that I thought was fascinating when we connected and asked you to play Craig. I do. Should I tell it now? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sure. Well, um, so I, when I was still a teenager, um, I went to New York City to do an internship. And it, you know, it was an unpaid internship. And so I needed like another job, but also I was coming from like Charlotte, North Carolina, right? Where like, I was barely out to anybody about just at the time thinking I was a lesbian, right? Like that's how sheltered I was that like transgender, like wasn't even in my frame of reference, right? And I was so excited to be going to New York City, you know, where I would meet all these other queers, right? And I made a, a beeline to the Oscar Wilde Memorial Bookshop because I, you know, I couldn't access the bars, right? Like I was too young. And so I went and I asked for a, you know, a part-time job. And there was this woman behind the counter, this like high femme. And she was like, look, there are no jobs here, but I can hire you because she ran a party out of Meow Mix, which was a bar on the Lower East Side. She's like, you can pass out these cards, I'll pay you some money, and I'll make sure you can get into the bar to come to the party yourself, which is like so illegal, but so great. Uh, and so, so you know, I went, I went to that bar and there was this guy there. And as far as I understood, this was like a, a lesbian party. And there was this guy who was like with these women and I, and I, was, I didn't understand. And that's the first guy that I met who I knew to be trans. And it was, of course, like, I was like, <gasps> you know, <laughs> and, you know, we had this whole conversation. He gave me a, I mean, how, how wonderful is this? He gave me a reading list, right? He's like, you need to know your history. And so I went back to the Oscar Wilde Memorial Bookshop and bought those books. And it was, uh, it was just amazing like that. I still, I can connect very easily to that feeling of finding a word for myself that matched the experience I was having, right? Because I was like, I don't think all lesbians want to be men. Right. So what, what, what am I, what does this mean? You know what I mean? And to just realize that there's a whole culture, that there's a whole history there. Right. And none of that would have happened were it not for the Oscar Wilde bookstore. Right. And for recognizing that that was a place that I could go, you know, no. And I think that's so, that's so interesting too, is like that, that was the first gay bookstore right? The first gay bookstore, I think, in the world, right? And that that sort of serves as a monument that I could know as a young person, that that would, that would be where I needed to, to find my community, right? That was, I don't know, it was just very special in that way. And, and, for, and for the viewers at home, the character Scott plays Craig Rodwell, he founded the Oscar Wilde bookstore, the first right. gay bookstore in the Sorry. world, which is just, you know, <laughs> yes. no. Like, and that's the punchline is it just, it brings it all home. It was so beautiful. Do you still have your tote bag? We I made do. Little Oscar Wilde tote bags uh, as part of the prop. So, yeah. It's so great when it's so serendipitous <laughs> with everything coming together in that way in a project yeah. like this. Stephen, I actually also wanted to, off the back of the, that, I wanted to ask you about working with Kimberly Reed, who's a really phenomenal director. You know, she made that fantastic documentary, Prodigal Sons, along with a number of mm. other projects. Um, and how you really felt that she was the perfect voice to bring in for that second episode and the perspective that she really bought behind the camera, but also working with her as a showrunner to make sure that there was still this linearity in the way that you were telling the stories across all of these episodes. Yeah, well, Kim, Kim's an old, good old friend of mine. I'm a, I really admire her as a filmmaker uh, and she's just a good friend. Like we've known each other for years. Um, so yeah, I just, there, there just came a point, you know, I'm greedy, I love, I, oh, a whole series, great. I get to direct everything. But uh, it, 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 we, and again, it was a constraint of the budget. We couldn't hire different people across every episode, but I felt like the trans stories needed a trans voice to really helm it and to really connect with the actors, with the stories, with the research, and to really bring a personal uh, approach to it. Uh, and I know she was gonna just, you know, knock it out of the park. She's incredible. Um, and we collaborated really closely. You know, I mean, I kind of gave the, the series a stylistic overview, but, 
you know, once we had our research, Kim wrote that script, Kim directed the talent. She consulted with the production designers. You know, we just, we were all really on the same page, I, you know, and then she would come to set and help me out, you know, uh, on my episodes. Like it was just, we were a good kind of, it was a really good support system. Uh, but I really wanted her to bring her and she, she brought more of a narrative aspect to it because the stories in that episode, we really went and, um, thanks to one of our great researchers, Jenny Olson, um, you know, found a character that Jenny had been researching that nobody knew about. And she said, well, why don't we put Jack Starr into episode two? Who's Jack Starr? Well, Jack was a trans, by all accounts, a trans man, gender non-conforming individual from, you know, the early 1900s into the 20s, 30s uh, in Montana, who was just in and out of the, in a jail constantly for refusing to be gender conforming uh, and just made the papers. So Jenny was able to trace this person's life through little pieces of, you know, news and he'd Jack would change uh, the, his name and it'd be Jacques Marais, it'd be Jack Starr. It would just, it, and he was an outlaw, a total outlaw, real badass. Um, but an early um, representation of a trans man. And there's a whole history of uh, characters who have been lost to history, whose only record is like in AP photos when they get arrested, you know, uh, and Jenny collects all that stuff. So, uh, you know, there's no archive, there's two photographs. So Kim really had to dig deep and figure out how do we uh, present these stories in a credible way, but also frame them with the documentary reality. And she did a phenomenal job. Yeah. And you're talking there about, you know, all of the archival material and research that Jenny really brought to the table. You also had Susan Stryker working with you on this project as well. And it sounds like there were just a myriad of contributors and voices who really bought a lot of information because the way that you've presented all of these stories for someone who's coming in for the very first time it's it's such an education and such a lesson and at the same time for people who know either part of the history or really rich elements of it it, it has that deeper dive as well um, and I could imagine that so much of that really just came down to that early process of research and so what did that look like in terms of finding all of that archival material you know diving through everything and then distilling down to what's really necessary for the episodes in the way that we want to tell them and for you scott how did that then influence your performance in having such access to you know all of this research and archival material and how deep did you want to go even beyond your character in the piece yeah, we did actually, we were, we were fortunate that we did have great, a great team. A lot of research was done beforehand, but uh, the One Archive was a big partner, right? One of the biggest, uh, most significant LGBTQ archives uh, in the world. We also worked very closely with the GLBT archives in San Francisco. Uh, you know, Jenny was really crucial. Susan Stryker gave us a lot of great advice. Um, and again, we're just a really good team of researchers. And so, as part of developing the show, yeah, I mean, there's just mountains of stuff. You know, we really, I, I like, I'm an archive nerd. I like to really dig and find hidden things. Actually, Scott, for your episode, spe specifically for the Stonewall episode, uh, what we really did use, and this is Jenny's stroke of genius, is she has a little kink for vintage uh, gay porn. Uh, and she's like, cut out all the sex and you basically have documentary archive. Because this <laughs> stuff was filmed in New York and San Francisco and LA and streets and bars on in people's rooms. And it was true. I mean, luckily we had a, you know, very uh, easygoing assistant editing team who was just like, cut, 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 cut. And then look, what do you know? All this great archive of the, and right there of the period, late sixties into the early seventies, which really helped frame, especially uh, the story of Craig Rodwell's coming to New York and giving it like a feel. We wanted the archive to really be immersive and give you a real sense of context and what it felt like at the time. Um, and then be able to give our actors enough material. Like, you know, there's not really a lot of video of Craig, but we have photographs, we have audio interviews. Uh, we, the, um, of course, also Eric Marcus uh, has one of the biggest Kind of oral history projects uh telling you know the stories firsthand of you know just this gay gay history from you know 
olden times until just recently. And he's, he's got it all. So we use a lot of that audio archive. Uh, it's a really valuable resource. Lots of oral history projects. Somehow, like some of the gay archives uh, somehow are very particularly good at oral history projects and collecting stories uh, and just banking them. Some are just sitting on cassettes, you know, and you got to get in there and digitize them. But we really wanted to pull as much authentic material together as possible and, you know, give our actors uh, a foundation to work from. Well, and that was really magical for me. I remember being on that white psych set that we used. And I mean, I love the projections that were going on for as sort of acting within that. It created this almost sort of ghostly uh, atmosphere for me that was really grounding, right? You know, the, I, I remember there was just this loop where I could see people and I was looking and I, and there was this one old man who kept walking across and I thought, yeah. That guy was so old. I mean, he could, he must, he looked like 80 plus years old. Right. And I was thinking, so if he was 80 years old in 1969, that means he was born in the 19th century. Right. And here he is now in this moment. Right. Yeah. So we had this, we had this moment where we were talking about, you know, my performance and how much did I need to really sort of mirror Craig from, from the archives that I've been able to watch. And, you know, he was a very, very sort of stoic, you know, and I'm, I'm very much the opposite, right? <laughs> and I liked that you encouraged me to add a little bit more of myself because I came in very, very stoic, very contained, very dialed in. And it, it, didn't, it didn't bring the energy that you needed. And so I love the opportunity to be able to add my energy to all of the sort of feeling like a, a vessel for bringing Craig Rodwell through. Do you know what I mean? Because I feel like that is so much the project of equal, right? That we are their dream, right? That we are the, the product of their liberation, right? And so to be able to put that and be all of that all in one place was actually a really magical experience. That's exactly what we were going for. I, I knew that, yeah, <laughs> it's perfect. It, I love when someone else explains it 10 times better than you ever could. <laughs> That's right on, but no, you're right. It's like, cause I, I told everybody like, we're not, we don't want people to copy or try to, you know, or, or impersonate these people. Again, it's, it's all conduits, you know? I mean, we are all standing on the shoulders of so to have them kind of come through, like Haley Sahar just created her own Sylvia Rivera. There's so many aspects of it that are so true to Sylvia, but she's really very much herself as well. You know, she worked on like details of accent and maybe mannerism. And then, you know, uh, what really helped everybody is our costume designer, um, Elizabeth Warren was a, a total rock star. And, you know, and the hair, actually the hair, the whole, the whole depart, like art department and the, the costume and makeup, they really wanted to give the actors like this, those little pieces that could just really help them. Even if it was like the Oscar Wilde tote bag, you know, uh, with a logo on it for Craig or Sylvia's hair at a certain period that felt very Sylvia. Everybody had like a little talisman or a token that, you know, could really help them hang on. Yeah, I mean, we, they, were, they were meant to be stylized, a little cheeky, a little campy. We wanted to have fun with it and present all of the history in a really unified, stylistic way, um, but in a way that would let people in and make them want to, like, learn more, you know? Um, I know sometimes these historical things, it can be telling too much too soon or it can be a little dry. You know, we just wanted, we wanted to have the talent embody uh, these characters in a really fresh way and like create an environment for them to react to, you know, with the projections on the sets. It was a lot of fun. And I love that one of the spaces where you really allowed that injection of personality is with Billy Porter's narration. And you can tell that the scripts were written with like that sense of kind of like confidence and action and immediacy and tension when it's building. And all of that was there for him to jump off of, but then there's still the inflections of his personality and the way that he really elevates the text. And so what was it like working with him and really figuring out what you wanted the tone of delivery to be and working with him on that performance as a voiceover artist? Oh my God, incredible. I mean, he had been wanting to do voiceover work for a long time and told us like, there were those times when people would just say, you don't have the 
that vo- no one wants your voice. It's too gay. It's too high. It's too this is too that. And, you know, now that he's like arrived, right. It's like, well, who wouldn't want that? I mean, it's Billy Porter. He's, it's ridiculous that there would be like that a voice would be judged for those qualities, but it it's, it's everything and more. I mean, it's, he's fantastic. Um, and yeah, it was, you know, uh, initially there was no real voiceover. We really wanted the characters to do all the work, but you know, as you edit and things get shorter and executives want things to move quicker, sometimes just feel like, you know what, if we just wrap this with a great vibrant narration, it's going to really going to elevate things. It's going to help us move things editorially. But if we can inject another level of, of attitude, of militancy, of, you know, of fun, of sass, all that stuff, just to really lift it, it'll be a lot more fun. Um, And, you know, we were doing this right as, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter and protests were erupting on the streets. There was a real feeling uh, that, you know, uh, a sense of activism uh, within our own history needs to be turned up. People need to be reminded it's okay to be a little, to, you know, to uh, approach some of this with uh, righteousness and anger um, because it's there. And uh, even on page, I know, I remember we got one note from one person somewhere that was like, oh, it's a little too angry. It's a little too, you know, fist raised, militant, blah, blah. And Billy was just like, oh, hell no. <laughs> like, you can't go far enough. I'm sorry this is not the time to be quiet and behave. So we're like, all right, let it go, man. Let it loose. And um, he just took it all to an, he he improvised a lot, which was great. So, uh, you know, and we, every time he would go off script, pretty much all of that stuff was what we ended up using. Um, Cause he was just brilliant. It was excellent. He really brought that forceful energy to it that it needed. I feel like every documentary should have a DVD extra with Billy Porter doing their voiceover as an option. Oh my God. Excellent. Yeah. It's a call to arms. I mean, it was always to me a call to arms, you know, you see what happened. I don't know if you saw, you know, uh, welcome to Chechnya. You know what I mean? Like what, what we experienced in the fifties, uh, you know, my God, they're hunting gay people. It's, but we're still experiencing it here in our own country. I mean, it's like we're, we've, you know, there's miles to go before we've achieved what we're looking to achieve here, but hopefully this will create that sense of historical context and be a a rabble rouser, you know, for the current moment. Scott, I also wanted to talk about, in terms of your performance, the two different places in his life where we meet Craig, because at the beginning, there's this kind of excitement. I'm in New York, you know, the gay movement is happening. And then there's the post Stonewall and how that really completely revolutionized how he thought about civil disobedience and what was actually needed for action and change. And I think in your performance, you capture those two different tonalities of reality really, really well. So how are you thinking about those two juxtaposing ideologies that this same individual had throughout these experiences? Wow. Well, thank you uh, for that. That that's what I was going for. So I'm glad I'm glad it read. But honestly, it's because I've lived both things. Right. So this is going to be it's 2021. So this will be my my 21st pride. (laughs) If you can believe it. Um, And that was my first pride was that summer when I when I went to New York and I and I went to the Oscar Wilde bookstore. Right. So it's kind of an amazing thing. and, And it was that sort of like, wow. And pride. Uh, 2000 was this massive event, you know, it was just huge. And so I had that sort of bright eyed sort of wandering around, like, what have I, what have I found? This is amazing. You know, we're, we're real far from Charlotte, you know, (laughs) and, and now 21 years through that, right. A lot has happened. So much has changed. So much hasn't. Um, My commitment to my community has only grown. And so I really felt that in, in the way that Craig and the other activists that he worked with really wanting to memorialize that moment of Stonewall and to say like, let's never forget this. And yes, let's, let's add our joy. Let's, let's, you know, let's continue to burst out of it. Right. In that way, like that is the revolution. Right. Um, I fully understand that from my own personal life lived in pride. 
And Stephen, you know, that description that Scott just mentioned about, you know, living in joy and you mentioning earlier that it is a call to arms. There's so many different tones and moments and themes that you manage to capture throughout the series and, and you kind of weave them all together really successfully that it, it is a call to action for people watching it, that there is a lot of tension, there is danger that, you know, the LGBTQ community have, you know, so much violence has been committed against them, but also there is a hopefulness to it and there is that exuberance and there is the joy and celebration of community. And it just feels like such a huge monumental challenge in making this piece, but also such a necessary one. So what was your journey of trying to really navigate bringing all of that together in these four episodes throughout the entire telling of these stories? Oh boy. Uh, well, I, it's a team effort. You know what I mean? Uh, we really ran it like a little TV show. Every episode had a story a producer and an editor. Uh, you know, we had a researcher across it all. We had a couple of E's, great producers. Um, it's impossible. I mean, I always approach, I always knew it was going to kind of be like a, a primer in some ways. Like you have to just pick. Uh, and we wanted to create representative stories and, sh you know, make sure each episode uh, explored a certain facet and was diverse within that facet. Um, but again, you say theme, that was the kind of overarching sort of idea. You know, each episode sort of had its own little civil disobedience, each one building a, like a raid, you know, from a, a picket line to a raid to a riot, you know, it just kind of built um, in that way uh, to show just how a handful of people contributed to this larger uh, movement that hopefully, you know, was all moving in the same direction. It's really complicated because, you know, like we do explain in episode four, trans people were left out of the mainstream of the movement. You know, Sylvia Rivera, the famous quote, it's, it's a great clip. Every documentary uses it, but they should because the more people that listen to Sylvia Rivera's words and understand her anger, the more we'll learn from that, you know, when, you know, gays and lesbians in that white middle class club kind of exclude parts of the community. Um, it was a real struggle then. It's still a struggle now. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, it's a hard question to answer. It's just, you know, we just pulled in as much advice and guidance as we could. And we learned from our talent, too. You know, I mean, the, the, the cast was incredible. They didn't have a lot of time to prepare. You know, they, everyone was in and out. There were little monologues. Um, so we wanted to, you know, let them bring as much of themselves, themselves to it as possible that, again, would hopefully add to the overall sense of what we're trying to accomplish. Well, I'm so thrilled that we have a film like this that really speaks to the history of the community. So thank you so much for making this project and for sharing so much about it today to both of you. It was glad I got the chance to do it. Yeah.